Hello everyone, I'm John Cunnison. I'm the Chief Investment Officer at Baker Boyer Bank and welcome to Ask the Expert. So our video series where we ask all of you to submit questions to ask and we'll do our very best to answer them. Um, but some of the best questions are going to be those where probably the best answer is just another question, right? Those are the ones about an unknown future. And that is what we've got today. So today, uh, we got a question about Bitcoin. Now, the question was a little long and complicated, so I'm going to summarize it quickly. And basically, the question is around, uh, you know, there's some su support for cryptocurrency from the new administration. What does it mean for the stability for the global financial system? Is it possible that it could replace U.S. hard currency? Um, and are there any questions around it being basically like a Ponzi scheme? And then there's some questions around concerns about energy use, things like that. So let's jump right in. But before we do, I want to talk just a moment about just new technologies generally. And if we look to history, whether it's AI or the internet or email or automobiles or fire, um, there's always been people who where new technologies are very frightening to them. And there are people who are very excited by them. Right? And generally speaking, new technologies are not good or bad inherently. It depends on who's using them and how they're using them. Right? So let's jump into two things. One is, let's first just talk, before we answer the questions, let's talk a little bit about what is cryptocurrency. Um, and then we'll address those questions more specifically. So cryptocurrency, I think the most important thing for me anyway, when I'm understanding this whole topic, is to understand that cryptocurrency didn't just spring up out of nowhere sometime in the last decade. Right? Cryptocurrency was decades in the making. And really, it's the result of the study of cryptography, which is this very specific area of computer science, which attempts to keep things you know, secret and secure in a digital form. Right? So this study of cryptography gave rise to um, this idea of the blockchain. Now, the blockchain, this is, this is a, a software system that allows people to make financial transactions digitally. It's completely transparent. It's very secure, virtually unhackable, just because the encryption of that technology is very good. I would explain it. It's very complicated. This is part of what that computer science did. This is the study of cryptography. Now, how did all of that and the creation of or the study of cryptography, the creation of this thing called a blockchain, which is a kind of software, how did all of that lead then to cryptocurrency? Now, this all happened in January of 2009. And there was a computer scientist who is famous in cryptocurrency circles, a computer scientist whose pseudonym, nobody knows who he really is or what group he represents, um, but this, this person is named Satoshi Nakamoto. Right? And in January of 2009, Satoshi Nakamoto released online a software, right, which was basically Bitcoin. Right? And Bitcoin was released, Bitcoin software was released on the blockchain. And many of the things that I'm saying right now may sound very confusing, but the bottom line is that these are ways to facilitate financial transactions online, very transparent, um, and, and quite secure. Now, in January of 2009, when Satoshi launched this, it was really more of an academic exercise. Here's a computer scientist who's been studying this for his life wrote this paper, which established this software protocol, right? And, and the people using it were his very best friends, right? These were other computer scientists. It was a very small group of the nerdiest nerds you can possibly imagine having a lot of fun with this software system that they had developed. Now, it turned out that it was a very interesting idea, and obviously it has gained traction, right? And that was the birth of basically cryptocurrency. Now, it's really important right here for me to just take a moment. I'm going to pause and just say that there's a, it's important to distinguish between Bitcoin. This is this software system that was created by Satoshi Nakamoto in 2009. It was the very first one, right? And cryptocurrency generally, because after Bitcoin, 
there have been lots of different kinds of cryptocurrency, right? Now we refer to that all as cryptocurrency, but that's like the fact that we often refer to all soft drinks as Coke, right? There is an original Coke and then lots of soft drinks that have followed, right? The original Coke is Bitcoin. Everything else that followed is, you know, some other token that was created on maybe a different blockchain. It's like a different software. Right? And it's really important to note those differences because there's a lot of interesting technology and potential applications that apply to Bitcoin that don't apply to these other uh, cryptocurrencies. Now, to answer one of the questions that was asked in this question, which is basically, is all of this a Ponzi scheme? And I think the answer to that is, in many years, I think a lot of these cryptocurrencies that have sprung up, right? I don't think they'll exist in three, five, 10 years. I think that they'll vanish, right? And those, is it fair to call them Ponzi scheme? Maybe. But, the, but Bitcoin and some of the technology underlying Bitcoin is actually very, very interesting. Um, and, and so let's jump in then specifically to answer some of these questions that were put into the mailbag the first one I want, to, I want to address is, is this potentially destabilizing to the global financial system? Now, one way that we could tackle this question is just to look at how big is Bitcoin relative to other financial assets that we're more familiar with, like stocks and bonds. Well, if we look at the global uh, stock market, the global bond market. The global stock market is $130 trillion, global bond market $140 trillion. Right? Bitcoin is just under $2 trillion in total value if you added up all the existing Bitcoin and bits in the world. Right? So a fraction, you know, maybe 1% of the total financial assets that are trading. Now, if Bitcoin were to you know, completely go to zero, if it were to double in value, it's not going to destabilize the financial system. So I think, you know, my sense is that for its potential to destabilize the system, it's highly unlikely. So the other question that was raised was around currency. Now, um, and, I, and I, I say that because one, the, the person who asked the question asked, is it possible that Bitcoin is an attempt or could replace U.S. hard currency. So currency has three characteristics that are widely agreed upon. And to be a real currency, you have to have these characteristics. The first one is that it's a widely accepted means of payment, right? Is Bitcoin or other uh, cryptocurrencies a widely accepted means of payment? No. So they fail that test. Are they a unit of account? So if I were to ask you, hey, how, uh, what does it cost to buy a dozen of eggs in Bitcoin? Would you know the answer? Well, no. So it's not a very effective unit of account. The final one is a store of value. Here's where it gets a little more interesting. Um, if we ask the question, you know, is, uh, is it, a, is it a, uh, an effective store of value? Someone may point to the volatility of many cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoin, and say, you know, these are incredibly volatile. It's not a very effective store of value. Right? But, but some of the Bitcoin enthusiasts in particular, maybe other cryptocurrency enthusiasts as well, may point to the U.S. dollar and say, well, over long periods of time, the U.S. dollar loses value. It loses value to inflation. And part of the reason that's the case is because the, the total value of all the existing U.S. dollars is not finite. Right? It can expand as the Federal Reserve you know, basically creates more money, as the banking system creates more money. Right? So that creates inflation. It can create uh, a reduction in the value of the dollar, its purchasing power. So one of the use cases that a lot of cryptocurrency enthusiasts point to is the idea that, and this is specific, and this is where it's really important to distinguish between Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, is that Bitcoin... 21 million Bitcoin were created when the software was created, right? It's in the rules around how that software is used. There are 21 million Bitcoin, and there will never be any more than 21 million Bitcoin. There's a scarcity there, and that's what the Bitcoin enthusiasts will point to, to say that it, it potentially has a use case as a store of value, 
right? So it is not a currency, right? And it's very unlikely that it'll ever be a currency. But could it be a store of value? That's something that only the future will tell. So if I were just to summarize all my thoughts here, the one would be, should we worry about Bitcoin being, you know, actually, let me back up. Should we worry about cryptocurrency being a Ponzi scheme? Some of them certainly are not going to be around in three to five years. Um, is Bitcoin a Ponzi scheme or some of the more established crypt cryptocurrencies? Well, time will tell. We don't know. It's very early days in this new technology. Uh, the other question is, it could, could this potentially destabilize the global financial system? Unlikely, given its relative size. And then the final question is, is it likely that some of these cryptocurrencies will replace the U.S. dollar um, as, as the currency of the United States or the widely accepted one? It's unlikely, simply because it's not particularly useful in the ways that a, a, that a real currency is useful. So that, those are things that the dollar is actually pretty good at. Um, so this may be simply another uh, new financial innovation, a digitization of, uh, of a medium of exchange. So I hope you found that useful. If you have any questions about this, uh, please reach out to a member of your Baker Borio team. We have a lot of fun talking about these issues. Um, and we hope that uh, you'll put more questions into the mailbag so we can hit them next month in our Ask the Expert series. Thanks for joining me.